I want to talk to you for a couple minutes here about the New Baptist Movement. And when I say Baptist, I'm talking about the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement. This thing is getting bigger and bigger as time goes by. And you'll hear them saying about the old IFB is dying, it's dead, it's no, going to be no more soon, and things like this. I'm going to show you six points that prove that this new, new Baptist movement is in fact just Roman Catholic infiltrators coming in posing as Baptists. Okay, here we have six points. Chose the number six on purpose, of course, because the number six is the number of man. If you read Revelation chapter 13, it talks about that. And this system here is definitely man-made. It is not of the Lord. And it's so funny because they say well, it's the new IFB movement um, coming out right here in the end times. Well, uh, there's no strong doctrine that comes out in the end times. All right. If it's a, it's a system that's just coming out and things like that, uh, then it's part of the great falling away, the apostasy. But let's look at these six points here. Number one, they'll talk about being born and raised Baptist. We're going to go over these in more detail. Number two, doctrine of reprobation. That's very important. Number three, they'll have soul winning crusades. Notice the word crusades. Number four, replacement theology. The new IFB movement is big on replacement theology, just like the Catholic Church. Number five, official titles for clergy. And I would say not just titles, but authority, special uh, you know, things that you can't say against the man of God, if you know what I mean. And number six, you have church purification in addition to the cross. It's more than just the death of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Oh no, there's some more things now that have to be added into that. So we're going to talk about this here as we go through this thing. Number one, you'll hear him say, I was born and raised Baptist. Just like a Catholic, I was born and raised in the Catholic Church. What's going on there? Well, a Catholic, they, when they're born, they go in and they are baptized. You know, they sprinkle the water on the baby's head and all that other stuff. And then years later, they go through some courses and things like that, and they go through confirmation. All right? Just like a lot of Baptists. You say, well, they're not baptized as babies. Well, no, they're not baptized as babies, but they're brought up in the whole Sunday school thing. And a lot of them say this little sinner's prayer at a young age. I mean, I've heard of Baptists saying, I got saved when I was two years old, three years old. I have a three-year-old son. Uh, there's no possible way that that little boy can understand salvation. No possible way at all. all right? And that's why this whole system up here, that's why they get so upset about the thing of a changed life. How can you have a changed life when you're three years old? Okay, That's why they get upset about the thing of repenting of sin. They don't like that. They can't stand that thought of having conviction over your life of sin and saying, you know what, I can't keep living like this. God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Help me to change my life after salvation. See, they can't stand that. That's why they're always trying to get rid of the, the true biblical meaning of repentance. Very interesting. That's why to these people up here, being born again, it doesn't mean anything to them in reality. They don't understand being born again. Why? What was their life like before they got saved? Their professed conversion. See? It's very interesting. But you'll hear these people, and they'll cling to the thing of being a Baptist, just like the Catholics cling to the thing of being a Catholic. Very interesting. Here's an important one. Number two, the doctrine of reprobation. All right, they'll go to Romans chapter 1, and they'll use the verse. We'll go here quick. They'll use the verse where it talks about sodomites basically being given over to a reprobate mind and they say see once you're given over to a reprobate mind you can't get saved all right um verse 28 romans chapter 1 verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain god in their knowledge god gave them over to a reprobate mind to do to do those things which are not convenient all right so they'll say see once you're given over to a reprobate mind you can't be saved after that now here's where it gets really interesting because, you see, a lot of these Baptists, they will vehemently, these IFBers, they will vehemently denounce John Calvin and Calvinism. And yet, the doctrine of reprobation, and they'll actually talk about, you know, I believe in the doctrine of reprobation. This comes from Calvin, and ironically also from the Augustinians. Augustinian monks also talk about the thing of doctrine of reprobation. In Catholicism, this written here, I'm going to be bringing out a lot more on this too in the future. 
Um, Molinism, M-O-L-I-N-I-S-M, -I -I talks about predestination, okay? And the Jesuits were also very famous for this thing of Molinism. I'm going to show you a little bit more proof from a very controversial book I'm holding in my hands. But uh, the doctrine of predestination to salvation is the doctrine of election. Whereas the doctrine of predestination to damnation, this basically, from the Catholic angle, is the doctrine of reprobation. All right? Right there you have it. I'm going to show you the importance of this whole thing. But first, let me just show you a very interesting book that was sent to me. I'm sure that the uh, Jesuits probably don't want me to have this one, but I'm going to be doing a, a study on this thing in the future. Um, I'm still going through it. I'm about... You can see right there my bookmark. I just have that little tiny bit to go in the back there yet, but look at that symbol. How about that? And what we have here is uh, a book on divine providence. Can you see it there? And over here you have the Hill Obstat and the Imprimatur. So this is okayed by the Catholic clergy. And here you have right there in the list, notice the SJs, Society of Jesus. Three Jesuits. Again, not my opinion. People get so excited about this stuff. You know, oh, Denlinger thinks that, you know, the Jesuits are behind. I hold up the books, the actual books, show Jesuits that are involved and people say I'm a nut. No, I'm proving it, okay? But this is a whole book from Roman Catholic uh, priests, monks, Jesuits, all talking about Calvin's doctrine of predestination. And here's where it gets really interesting, okay, with this. A lot of people think of Calvinism as a theological type of a, a system whereby you say, okay, does God choose people for salvation and, and does he choose people for damnation? You hold the, the five points of Calvinism and they think of it from a theological perspective. But a lot of people do not think of Calvinism from the philosophical perspective. The perspective of you give up your free will to serve God. And they talk about that all through this thing. What's one of the Jesuit the parts of the Jesuit oath? To become basically like a corpse. To have no will of your own. To do the will of your superiors. Give up free will, you see. That's why the Jesuits like it so much. Very much into their philosophy there. And it isn't, isn't it interesting that the whole Baptist movement, they also employ some of that same, those same tactics. You need to give up your free time to come out soul winning. You need to be in church every time the doors are open. If you have to bust your family up, it doesn't matter. You need to be in church. I was part of it. I went through that thing. I was called, I was, I was said to be not faithful to Liberty Baptist Church in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Okay? I was said to not be faithful because I went, I skipped a service the one time to go to my niece's uh, second birthday, you know, when she turned two. I went to her birthday party, her uncle, you know, and I got, you know, oh, he's... Dunlinger's not faithful. He wasn't here in church every time the doors are open. Oh, yeah. I've been through the whole Baptist system. Don't tell me anything about it. If you're not there every time the doors are open and you're not involved in ministry and you're not involved in all this other stuff, you have to give up your free will many times. And if you do, you'll get your good pulpit mentions. You're, you're, you're highly favored among the Baptists and stuff like this. Oh, yeah. But see, here's a very important part of this thing, this doctrine of reprobation. If this is true, that you can prove that there are certain people that have been given over to a reprobate mind and they cannot be saved, there's no chance for them to be saved, then what's the next logical step? Condemn them as heretics and kill them. And a lot of these new Baptists, that's exactly what they believe. They believe that sodomites should be executed by a just and righteous government. Just like Catholics do. Catholics believe in executing heretics as well. And I mean, really, if you believe in this right here, what's wrong with that, with executing your enemies? 
You see? They can't get saved. The blood of Jesus Christ isn't there to pay for their sins. So since they've been turned to a reprobate mind, we're doing the world a favor by killing them. That's why this new Baptist movement is so dangerous. They believe in the doctrine of reprobation. They teach it. Again, I saw part of this thing as much as I could stomach this little dweeb. This guy came out and I, he tried to debunk my study I did showing that Jeff Dahmer did in fact get saved. There was a changed life there after his you know, conversion when he went to prison for doing the horrible, dastardly deeds he did. And he was saying Jeff Dahmer couldn't have been saved because he was turned over to a reprobate mind. Yeah. And they cheer the death. The fact that this guy, this, this black guy in, in prison, murdered Jeff Dahmer. They'll cheer that. Yeah. Incredible. Number three, soul winning crusades. I talked about the dangers of hyper soul winning. What these people call soul winning has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with what's done in the Bible. In the Bible, Christians went out into the public realm, into the public sec sector, and they worshiped the Lord out there and they preached the gospel publicly and they'd get people saved that way. They were not going around knocking doors and saying, we'd like to invite you to church this week. And getting people into this little, and have this little scripted little thing that you do. Can I take a moment of your time, please, and show you how you can know for sure that you'll go to heaven tonight. If you would die today, that you can know for sure how you get to heaven. If I could just have a few minutes of your time, I can take you through the scriptures and blah, 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 blah. It's fake. It's false. That whole soul winning movement. But what's it about? They call it soul winning crusades. They call it by the same word that Catholics use to take over lands, to take over places and things like that. It's a crusade. Why? What's really behind this motivation right here? Or what's the, excuse me, what's the motivation behind this movement? To build more church buildings. Show me it in the Bible. Show me it in the scripture. We're to go out and win souls so we can build more church buildings and open up more churches in more areas and more and more and more and more and more. It's not there. Churches are people. And you can meet anywhere. You say, well, couldn't you just meet in a church building then? Well, you meet in a church building and then you start to, to do all the religious trappings of the, of the lost pagan world out there, the religious world out there, where you act a certain way in the church building, you act that way, and then you come home and you act different. Church is a place you go to. It's not a place that you're in all the time. That's the danger. And there's, of course, a lot more I could say on that whole thing. But again, very similar to what Catholicism does, going out conquering that's why, another thing, these Baptists, they'll go out and they'll do their soul winning crusades. They cannot cross off certain areas and say, the people didn't want us there. We're not going in there. Like Jesus told you know, his believers or his followers, his disciples, he told them, you know, if you go into a certain city and things and they don't receive you, shake off the dust off your feet and just say goodbye. These guys can't do that. They have to go in. They have to knock the doors. They have to get each street done and draw the, the highlight the, the streets on their map, the map of the town. It's a crusade. You see? Next, we have replacement theology. Again, this new Baptist movement is big on replacement theology. They have to teach that they have replaced the Jewish people. The Jewish people are evil. They're wicked. And they are very much wicked. They have rejected Jesus Christ. They do some very, very vile things and say some vile things. That's the whole purpose for the time of Jacob's trouble coming up. You know? But they, they say, oh no, we've replaced the Jews. So now instead of there being an Old Testament holy priesthood, now it's the uh, Catholics or the Baptists. Now instead of there being the Old Testament uh temple and tabernacle and thing. Oh no, now we have Baptist temples or Catholic temples. And of course, you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, it's all about the church. Yeah. Number five, official titles for clergy. I'll show you something on this. This is something that you'll see very much in the uh, IFB movement. You'll have certain, they call themselves men of God, and you don't dare question them. You don't dare speak against them. I heard a story the one time of uh, Vic, Victor Nishik, uh, the deacon, one of Jack Hiles' deacons, and Jack Hiles was fornicating with 
Victor Nishik's wife named Jenny. I uh, was his secretary. And uh, Vic Nick Nishik stood up at one time and tried to tried to rebuke Jack Hiles. And, uh, and Jack Hiles jumped up and screamed, you're trying to destroy fundamentalism. No, he's trying to, try, st trying to stop a sex pervert from messing with his wife. But these guys, they think of themselves as basically popes. That's what they do. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. A Nicolaitan is someone who rules over laity, who just holds themselves up in this kind of a higher position <coughs> where you can't dare question them. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, you'll have this. I was confronted on this thing years and years ago. Some guy said, Brother Brian, he said, you know, the, the thing of pastor calling, you know, I don't know if I was calling myself pastor, but he said, he said, is there any scripture where a man is supposed to take the title pastor? Because all you see through scripture is brother, you know, Paul or brother this or sister that or whatever else. Where's this thing of uh, official titles? It's a description. The word pastor is in the Bible. It's a description of a position, but it's never used as a title. Religious titles are of the devil. Sorry, but they are. Uh, the only, you know, I'll say one, and that is a rabbi, and that's Jesus' title, but that's because he's God manifest in the flesh. <clears throat> but again, you'll have this thing of official titles and official authority. Um, these guys will get really, really irritated and upset if you use their first name. Or just, you know, whatever. You know, they call them by anything but pastor. And I've, I've actually seen these IFB people. They'll actually just call the guy just plain down pastor. Pastor said we should go to do such and such. And pastor's wanting us to do this and that. And yet you look in Catholicism and they do the same thing, but they say, Father. Father Sullivan wanted us to go over here. Father, yes, for, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned and all this stuff in the confessional. There's no scripture for this. None. Again, a very, very dangerous thing. And uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 15 also says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. God hates it when certain people within the church set themselves up on a higher position. Okay? I'll show you a scripture on this thing of what's the proper thing supposed to be. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Peter had pretty good authority, in other words. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Not supposed to lord over the people. Not supposed to be a Nicolaitan. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, you say, oh, see, right there, submission to the elder. Keep reading. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. We're all to be subject one to another. Okay? So again, this whole movement right here of this official titles for clergy, it's not of God. And again, you know, totally Catholic, very much practiced by the Catholic Church. And finally, number six, the sixth point I want to make here is that church purification in the time of Jacob's trouble, right? It becomes a thing that's in addition to the cross, right? The Catholics, of course, they have their, their mass, or the Eucharist, you know, celebration thing. They have keeping the sacraments. You have to die in a state of grace and things. And the Catholic Church does teach that the church needs to go through a final time of purification, and this new IFB movement is also teaching the same thing. Jesus died on the cross, but he also had to go to hell and he had to burn for three days. A lot of these guys are teaching that. Jesus burned in hell along with dying on the cross. So the blood that he shed was not enough to pay for sins. He also had to burn in hell for three days to pay for your sins. 
And if that's not enough, you also have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Because you see, the church goes into the time of Jacob's trouble because Jacob has been replaced by the church. So there's going to be a refining time, a purification, you see? I mean, just break it down. Pre-trib versus post-trib, what people say. Pre-trib says, Jesus Christ paid it all. He took care of our sins. He's, they're, just, they're washed, they're clean, they're taken away. You see? And someday, he's going to you know, give us new incorruptible bodies at the rapture. We don't need any more purification or more whatever. We're going up. Post-tribbers say, oh no, actually, uh, there's coming a time when um, people are going to go into this final time of, of you know, God's judgment coming on the earth, and uh, some people aren't going to make it. And that's what they believe. So, just want to do this video here very quickly. These six points, I think, are very, very serious about this whole new IFB movement. Um, pretty dangerous thing. So, if you start to see some of these people trying to infiltrate your group as a Bible-believing group, uh, I'd kick them out. Okay, it's very, very dangerous, this whole thing. And again, it's all just, I mean, these guys are, they're closet Catholics is all that they are. Um, so, just wanted to warn you about that. Um, thank you for watching.